Hi everybody, thanks for coming out. I'm Dr. Joe Klassen, I'm a naturopathic doctor at Fish Creek Naturopathic Medicine. We're here today to talk about belly bugs and tummy trouble. We know that a lot of people have some pretty serious concerns and, and chronic uh, problems with gut health, and we're going to try to demystify some of that today and hopefully teach you a few things. See, we got some students in the crowd today, which is awesome, some of my former students. And it's great that uh, Hello. they've come in. Hi guys, welcome. Please come on in. That dealing with their gut issues has uh, provided tremendous benefits and uh, uh, some pretty tremendous weight loss, but also energy improvements, right? It's, it's actually really exciting to see. Where does digestion start? Shout it out. In your brain. Right. <laughs> so I know that's the classic answer, and that's what we get taught in schools, and it just happens to not be true. Digestion starts in the brain. As you anticipate that meal, you start to salivate. You, and you're not so aware that you've got other things going on, but improving the production of stomach acid, the activation of the enzymes, and maybe the motility through the digestive tract in anticipation of the food arriving. So things like chewing your food well stimulate that parasympathetic sense of rest and digest. And we live in a world that's really frustrating to good digestion. Um, the popularity of one-hand meals, right? That's, that's what's popular and, and attractive about a burger or a sandwich, right? You can eat it with one hand whilst you're still on the phone or God forbid driving, or you see people all the time. It's ground meat. It's, it's processed, a highly processed bun. You really don't have to chew it other than enough to break it off of the, the main part of the meal, chew it two or three times and swallow it down. And, and that's a really horrible way to digest your food because we're not engaged with our meal and we don't start with good digestion. The, the importance of good digestion to produce energy in our bodies, to power all of our activity. And, the digestive tract is a means of elimination of waste. Not just the food wastes, but we'll talk a little later about how the liver and the production of bile are, are a, a part of how we clear garbage from our body, including heavy metals and especially the uh, expired hormones. So as we, we look at the digestive tract, I really want you to understand the concept that if we can untangle it all, this is one long tube. It's got a different consistency in areas, and there's different things occurring at different points. But anything within this tube, although it is surrounded by our body, it is not within our body. We have to absorb those nutrients across the wall of that small intestine or large intestine to bring them into our body. Otherwise, it is simply surrounded by our body in the same way that if I took these keys, you know, okay, well, sure, they're surrounded by my body, but certainly nobody would agree that they're within my body. So we need to get those nutrients in, and we need to get the garbage out. And that's starting at the top, obviously, the, the mouth and the teeth for chewing, the esophagus guiding the food to the stomach where it'll be visited by acid, and hopefully a lot of acid, and that's somewhere that a lot of people can see improvement. The lack of stomach acid fails to initiate the rest of the digestive processes. You have to kill the viruses and the bacteria that's on your food with that level of acidity. And then how much acid leaves into the small intestine is what calls for the pancreas to release the antacid and more digestive enzymes. So people who have GERD it's not that they have too much acid, it's that they have acid touching tissue that it should not touch because they don't have that mucus lining to protect the tissue from the acid. So it's, it, they do feel better with an antacid, but that's not the problem. They don't have too much acid, acid's touching tissue that it shouldn't touch. And then the secondary digestion would be the bacteria or fungus uh, acting upon fiber and other foodstuffs to help with the production and absorption of different B vitamins, and, uh, even vitamin D, the uh, hormones being recirculated, and how to get the garbage out. So the large intestine is very important, not just the small intestine for absorption. 
And so again, starting from the top, we've got the chemical digestion where we have the acid and the enzyme, and we've got the physical, the peristalsis, the movement of the muscle, swishing the, the foodstuffs around in the, the lumen of the contents of the small intestine. And it's really important. And if that's shut down, especially by stress, and then also think about what happens when we sit, right? We're really increasing that pressure and that space in here. So if you're sitting at a desk after your meal, you've, you've got that compression. And so you don't have such good mixing of the food in the digestion tract. And of course, we have the blood vessels, which are so important, and the lymphatics to absorb those nutrients and the healthy fats and vitamins and nutrients. So one of the most poorly under, understood components of the digestion is the gallbladder and the production of bile. We call that the biliary tree, where it's made in the liver, it's stored in the gallbladder, and then released. And that's very important for fat absorption and managing fat in the digestive tract, but especially for clearing of toxic elements, fat-soluble garbage that we might bring in, environmental pollutants, estrogen-like chemicals, you have to produce the bile and release it into the digestive tract in order to clear it from the bloodstream. And so it's, it's very important that we've got a healthy biliary tree. In the small intestine, I mentioned that the enzymes now released from the pancreas continue to digest the food, breaking down the proteins and the carbohydrates and the fats into the smaller, more absorbable unit. This is really important when it comes especially to the protein. It's one of the reasons why we're seeing an increase in people having food sensitivity, because they're not breaking those proteins down into the individual amino acids. So those fragments can make it farther down the small intestine and interact with the immune system, especially in the last five feet of the small intestine. You've got so much of your body's immunity so those fragments, if they haven't disintegrated, can now be identified by the body. So we, if we enhance the quality of digestion, physically, chemically, we reduce the amount of inflammation that people have for their food. So leaky gut is a, a popular term. And I hate the term, but I think it's used because it makes sense for people. I talked about the importance of that too. And if that tube has lost its integrity so that there's now gaps in it, it's not well sealed, that's how the foodstuffs have more opportunity to interact with our immune system. So that's maybe where somebody who's not had a digestive issue all of a sudden gets a flu or they've got some incident. And then after that, they have an ongoing basis problem with their, their digestion. That's because during that infection, that integrity that they've always had was lost. And that's the point at which they got sensitized to these foods. And so I'll, I encounter somebody who's maybe 40 or 50 years old, and they've always been rock solid. And now they're like, oh my gosh, ever since this event, I have had tummy trouble. And that's, it's hard to understand. How, how, can I, how can this happen? I haven't had this in the past. That this can come on at any stage in life. And from here on, once your immune system has seen it, it can now continue to react to that food. The common issues, and you guys spoon-fed me at the beginning of the chat, but for sure, constipation, gas, and bloating. Those are three of the most common reasons people visit my clinic. Uh, and uh, visiting also their family physician. And they feel very frustrated because they're not getting ahead on these concerns. They say, I, I try the medication, but it doesn't change anything. Or I know that taking a, an antacid is going to put me at risk for osteoporosis later in life because I can't absorb these nutrients. So we need to understand why they have poor digestion to get them to a better place. The urgent and loose stools and the toxic effects of having bad digestion and especially the excess of inflammation. So that's where the digestion then manifests as skin issues. We've seen so many people who have psoriasis and eczema have, have excellent resolution or 
great improvements by taking the inflammation out of their gut. Another thing that makes quite a difference, and it's not, again, where you would first think, but uh, women with reproductive challenges, especially with PMS or pain with, uh, uh, you know, in menopause, because when you look at the abdomen, and if you think of that as the pelvic bowl, the small intestine, the end where all that inflammation resides, is, is surrounding the uterus and the vagina, the rectum, the, the uh, ovaries and the bladder. And so if the adjacent tissues are irritated, that's going to drive the, the neighbor's nuts, as it were. So uh, things that we do to make our, our digestion work, eating huge meals and drinking massive quantities of fluid with the meal. So now I, I mentioned how bad the burger is on digestion. And then you think about a 50 ounce big gulp with it, right? And, and because the excess fluid dilutes the strength of the acid, so it really does make a difference. Excess portions, you just don't have enough capacity at once. And heredity, people have a, a, a genetic predisposition to certain sensitivities and, and uh, things like celiac disease. It's our lifestyle, we're busy, we eat on the run, we don't chew our food well, we don't savor the meal and enjoy it, right? So we never engage that parasympathetic rest and digest mode. Uh, parasites and fungal overgrowth is, and, and toxicities, especially things like antibiotics in our foodstuffs. And it's not just an antibiotic overtly, but you know, have you ever gone and, and ordered uh, perhaps a pint of beer and you know, your first pint was fine, and then the second pint you brought a new glass and it was flat, and you taste it, it tastes like that chlorine. And that's because they didn't rinse the glass well enough in the uh, three stages of rinsing in the kitchen. And so then you'll get that, that you know, whack of chlorine in your system and it can knock out your gut bugs, as well as cleaning agents and all manner of things that can really reduce our, our healthy gut flora. So how do we help ourselves? Number one, relax and eat. And, and I know I know it sounds contrite, but you really need to be with your meal, to, to breathe and, and shut off the phone, and not be uh, at your desk at the office, but take the time to walk to a, a lunchroom or you know, that, and condition your body. And, and it's an intended pun, but it's Pavlovian, right? If you get used to walking to the kitchen to have a meal, when you start walking to the kitchen at 11.30, your body will start to engage the digestive processes. You don't need to take an hour off, but you really do need that 10 or 15 minutes to enjoy your meal, to chew the food well, and, and to get into a different headspace. And I know people are, are very convinced about their multitasking, and it's just, it's just not true. If you had taken that 10, 15 minutes out in the middle of the day to clear your head and enjoy your meal, Although there was 15 minutes, you weren't at your desk working. I promise you that by the end of the day, you got more done because you took the time to enjoy your meal. You don't have that dull, sluggish feeling of rereading the paragraph four times after you've had a giant rice bowl. <clears throat> because if you're digesting your food, you won't have that lull in the afternoon. So I don't think it takes away at all. So uh, things like apple cider vinegar to acidify the beginning of your meal. You can take digestive enzymes, you can take plant enzymes like bromelain and caffeine. When do you take apple cider vinegar? Uh, you would take apple cider vinegar shortly before the meal. And, and what you want to do is to really taste it so you get that, that bitterness, that astringent sense of, oh, you know, something's coming. And that's why that concept of bitters before your meal or an aperitif, uh, some people might have a schnapps, or a, you know, uh, that is to stimulate, wake up your sense of digestion. And so any of those things, you could, really you could bite a lemon, you could uh, squeeze some lemon into your water, and, and anything like that will stimulate it. I like the idea of the herbal bitters, but uh, I, they're pretty potent, and uh, not everybody is going to want to take something that strong before their meal. But 
but it's a good choice. Uh, and reducing stress, and reducing stress all day long. Just to breathe, go to a yoga class, go online and find uh, one of the uh, apps or some demonstrations of breath work. And it's very easy, it takes only minutes, but to do that deep breathing that brings your body into the parasympathetic mode will do wonders for your digestion. And probably for your sleep, and your mood, and your energy. So eating healthy whole foods. Highly processed foods don't require chewing, your body is not even aware of them. You need to get foods, especially with fiber, to serve as the food source for the healthy bacteria. I'm gonna to talk towards the end about the importance of butyrate and the short chain fatty acids. Now that we understand the gut flora more, that's the biggest area of new research in, in medicine is how the gut flora, right? And the microbiome is related to everything. You just go to any of the news stories and it's always, oh, the gut, the gut, uh, gut bugs and schizophrenia, gut bugs and inflammation. And, and it's true, we're getting this great understanding. But what we don't have is an understanding of how to improve it. Because it won't be fixed just by taking your pill. You have to feed the gut bug. And it's a complex process. But the, the pharma companies are out there looking and waiting for the next shiny eyed a grad student to magically find the, the right next uh, probiotic. And, and they're all waiting because it doesn't exist. You have to have real food. And that's what's been beaten out of so many of our processed or overly cooked or overly sterilized foods is the fiber. So keep that in mind that we will have to learn how to feed the gut microbiome and not just uh, get it in a pill. And, and, that, and that drives the conventional medical system nuts, right? There should be one organism equals this disease, and it's not how it works. So, um, you're avoiding your, your food sensitivities if you have them, and digesting your food well. Adding fermented foods, and I, I don't mean commercial uh, sauerkraut that's been pasteurized, but either making it yourself or supporting local um, vendors who might be selling at the farmer's market or the health food store. There's a, a number of the, the CSNN grads that have a business selling these products. And they're, they're made the right way. Uh, or go see Malcolm at the Light Cellar. And uh, you know, they've got great, great products and lessons and instruction for you on how to do it. Uh, you know, an anti-candida diet, an anti-parasitic diet. And, and the herbs that we might use with that. Repairing the gut wall and, and the mucilaginous herbs, right? The ones that have the, the mucil, uh, the mucilage is, is a very uh, slimy, if you would, or gel-like form of fiber. And so slippery elm and marshmallow, uh, buying the whole herb and into a, a tea is really soothing, although you can get them in encapsulated form. Butyrate, <coughs> no. Butyrate is going to be controversial because we realize that it is so well absorbed that trying to get butyrate orally to the end of the digestive tract doesn't work. It's absorbed long before it makes it to the bowel. But we need butyrate in the bowel as the perfect food source for the epithelia of the bowel. So you either need to use it as a suppository or get your gut bugs to make it. And I think that's the most desirable way because that's a long-lasting benefit. Replacing good bacteria where you can. Get rid of the dysbiotic bacteria. So stop feeding them uh, super refined sugary things. And you know, I guess there's really three things we do to get rid of bad bacteria. We crowd them out with healthy colonies of good bacteria. We starve them out by fully digesting our food and not letting partially digested foodstuffs make it to the bowel to serve as a food source for them. And thirdly, we, we kill the rotten buggers with, with the herbs, and it works really well. The food herbs are such a good choice. <clears throat> and remember, that's how those herbs came into our collective menu, as it were. 
right? The, the Japanese did not use wasabi and pickled ginger because it made a nice topping. It's because those are anti-parasitics, and so those complemented a food that was making people sick, but it was a way to store it. If you look at Italian cooking, the thyme and the rosemary and the oregano, what are they? They're awesome antimicrobials. They're anti-parasitic. So in a, in a time when they didn't have good refrigeration, this added storage time to their food. And that's why they continue to be used in the menu. Now, they do taste pleasant, but that's a, a, something we've acquired. But the reason that they're called herbs and not called poisons or toxic is because they don't have such an effect on our good bacteria. They tend to only seem to target or have a much greater effect in reasonable doses on the bad bacteria. So that's how come we continue to use them. And you can go to look at the Asian spices and you'll find the same thing. It's hot spices, right? The capsicum products, the peppers. You'll see that all around the equator. Why? It adds to the safety of the food. L-glutamine can be taken in, in rather high doses, but I really think simply using that is not enough. You have to deal with the gut flora. 